I'm David Oshinsky, the director of the Division of Medical Humanities. Uh, I think we have a wonderful program for you. Three panels discussing various aspects of the iconic House of God on its 40th anniversary. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Bob Grossman, the Saul J. Farber Dean and Chief Executive Officer of NYU Langone Health. Bob joined our faculty in 2001 as the chair of the Department of Radiology and took over the reins of NYU Langone just over a decade ago. Uh, in that time, as you know, our medical school has been on an upward trajectory of what I would really call epic proportions. The quality and diversity of our student body has increased dramatically, so too our faculty. Under Dr. Grossman's leadership, NY introduced the school's remarkable three-year medical degree program. And of course, this year came the announcement of tuition-free medical education, an absolute bombshell, years in the making, and certain to revolutionize professional education in medicine, and I think well beyond. This year as well, New York News, uh, US News uh, ranked our medical school third in research, just behind Harvard and Johns Hopkins, and tied with Stanford. A decade ago, when Dr. Grossman took over, I don't have the exact figures, but I think we were somewhere in the 30s. So the trajectory has really been extraordinary. When I speak to alumni groups in Boston or Los Angeles or Miami, the most obvious impression I get is the swelling sense of pride these graduates feel in the current direction of our medical school, almost always followed by the words, man, there's no way I could get in here now. What I would also say is that many of them ask the same question, which is, is free tuition retroactive? Uh, I think the answer, we know the answer to that. It's all of this is a tribute to our leadership, our faculty, our staff, a community effort grounded in excellence, satisfaction, and devilishly hard work. So let me now welcome Dr. Grossman. Thank you, David, and thank you for the kind words. Everybody, uh, welcome to the celebration of the House of God. And some would say you're here in the house that Home Depot built. <laughs> <laughs> now, 1973 was a very good year. And um, I have to admit that actually I was an intern at the BI in 1973, I was a surgical resident and I flew under the radar screen for uh, the House of God and uh, <laughs> I kept a very low profile. Um, and uh, I, I have many uh, fond memories of uh, the Beth Israel and, and uh, the people uh, one observation was that in 1973, everybody thought they knew what they wanted, and Shem wanted to be a world-famous psychiatrist, uh, and I wanted to be a private practice neurosurgeon. <laughs> he, got to be, he got to be an author, and I got to be an administrator. Uh, and uh, out of the uh, internship year, he got a book, and I got a Harvard medical student wife. So, <laughs> so it worked out pretty well. Anyway, uh, this will be a, a, a great afternoon, and I am looking forward to it. And uh, it should be fantastic for all of us. So th thank you, uh, Steve, and, and uh, Thanks for all you've done uh, to make uh, the House of God uh, come to NYU. Thank you. So uh, I'm
I'm Steve Abramson. There's a lot of connections here to the House of God. I think I was a third year medical student at Harvard in the BI in 1973. And the character that I remember most was 007, <laughs> who had the license to kill. <laughs> license I don't to kill. Think, license to kill. Doctors. I don't think anyone in the front row was that person. Right? No, no. no, no. <laughs> okay. In any event, many of us read the book. Many of us, I'm sure many of you here, uh, read the book, and it, it did leave an indelible mark. Uh, the 12 rules of the house of God. Uh, in fact, the one I continue to use when I teach when a house officer makes a big mistake and did everything right. Rule number four of the house of God is the patient is the one with the disease. And sometimes if you feel bad about yourself because you think you made an error but you didn't, you have to remember that sometimes you take care of people uh, who are not going to do well no matter how good you are. So all of us, or many of us, I'm sure, have little snippets of the, uh, of the book in their mind. And I think this is a great opportunity for the panel uh, to reflect back on the book and what it meant to them. Uh, it's titled The House of God, Fiction, Memory, and Medicine. And we have a very distinguished panel. You can obviously read their uh, biographies uh, in, in, the, in the handout. Um, but <clears throat> we really have Dr. Arthur Kaplan, who's the head of our division of uh, biomedical ethics and really a world-renowned biomedical ethicist. Uh, I read a Sharon from um, uh, Columbia, uh, who's made a, a, a significant mark in the field of medical humanities and narratives and teaching. And of course, uh, Samuel Shem himself, uh, who needs, uh, frankly, no introduction. So we're really, uh, uh, really great, a great panel. What, we, what we're gonna do um, for the panel is ask each of the individuals to give simply a five to seven minute uh, overview of um, what, the House of God meant to them, and looking back at the narrative. Uh, and then we have open it for questions for everyone. So uh, perhaps Dr. Kaplan, do you want to lead? Thanks, Steve, and thanks uh, for putting this event together. I was telling Sam since he got here, it's been a real pleasure to have him as a colleague. Um, it's uh, wonderful that we have this celebratory event, uh, much uh, well-deserved. I uh, was told that uh, we should talk for five to seven minutes. I've never actually done that, so <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll be a novel experience for me, maybe for some of you too, who've had to listen to me. Um, but let me uh, tell you that in 1973, uh, I was only about seven years old. No, I was, uh, I had, uh, uh, no idea about the House of God, really, but I'd heard about it from people. And what I was doing was I had shown up at Columbia Medical School and was uh, thinking about ethics because I was watching different ethics problems occur in that particular hospital. Rita, this was a different era. They had problems then. Yeah, very, very different. So. Uh, one thing that uh, was going on was that we had uh, patients who were seriously ill and some of them very old, and we were being told to do many things to them. Um, that uh, a lot of uh, intervention would be appropriate uh, to try and do our best by these people. And at that time, we had a lot of new technologies that we were all pretty fascinated with. If you think about the way we treat today genetics, precision medicine, immunotherapy. At that time, it was the ICU, dialysis, transplants, a lot of very exciting things that would allow us to uh, battle, we thought, uh, serious illness in very sick people. Um, but basically, the house of God uh, scared the bejeebers out of me. It said, uh, your intern years were going to be full of hassle. Uh, and uh, that wasn't uh, something I was looking forward to. It did say there was lots of sex around, but that seemed impossible to me at the time. So <laughs> maybe so, but uh, who was that guy, the runt, uh, who said, uh, I don't want to give up my chances, even though it's impossible. I was sort of in that camp. Um, 
There were uh, some suggestion that the smartest people in the place were the two security guards, <laughs> which may have been true. I don't know. It's entirely possible at the BI. Maybe it was true uh, down at Columbia. Um, and I was very uh, taken with the ethical issues that the book raised, so I decided to trot off and go get a master's degree in philosophy from Columbia. Um, when I got there, I was told by the philosophy department two things that were somewhat unnerving. One, they said we don't and are not interested in the ethics of plumbers. They meant doctors. That, that doesn't interest us. We're trying to figure out if ethics is possible, not whether you could actually solve ethical dilemmas, but <laughs> is it even uh, possible to have ethics? And two, master's degrees are only awarded to people who flunk out of the PhD program. And so it's a uh, bogus degree. And uh, unless you're planning to fail, uh, you couldn't get that. I, I assured them I was planning to fail, and I wanted that degree. Uh, so they took me in. Medical school uptown was trying to figure out where I'd gone. A few of the deans knew that I was down there doing this. But by the time I emerged back out and returned, I had decided to uh, think more systematically about ethics, partly in response to the kind of issues that were raised in the book. Was it right to go full bore on very sick patients? Would our technologies really do them a lot of good? Or was it the case, as I guess the fat man used to say, you know, do less, they'll respond to that. <laughs> And I think there was truth in that, and there remains to be truth in that, although sadly, I'm not sure we've learned that lesson completely. We still, I think, over-treat frequently uh, when we shouldn't, and we uh, sort of get into ethical muddles because of that. Um, I believe also that uh, when I got back, the uh, notion of abusing interns was starting to wane, and if I could put a Me Too hashtag on, I even think the idea that you could exploit uh, females who were around the hospital was beginning to be challenged. It hadn't disappeared, but it was starting to be put to question. So bioethics, in a sense, emerged from the kind of climate, even as a satire, that the book presented in my mind. It was uh, certainly a set of issues and questions that demanded a more systematic response. So I'll end, I think I got five minutes here. So I'll end uh, my remarks by saying, I wouldn't say Sam uh, sent me off to uh, sort of invent bioethics. That wouldn't be accurate. But I was partly uh, put into questioning what I had viewed as an unquestionable career path by that book, trying to uh, think about some of the messages, think about some of the issues and problems that it sort of gave the back of the hand to indirectly, often with a sense of humor, which I liked. Um, and so it, it played a major role in my evolution, but I think it played a major role in grounding the environment that allowed bioethics, my field, to grow, because people were ready to ask those questions, much more so post the book. Thank you, Arthur. Dr. Sharon? So I have a counterfactual. Um, I was a third year student at Harvard, did a lot of my stuff at the BI in 1977. So I kind of worked with a lot of the people in the book. And, and I wasn't, we weren't even sure whether the House of God was actually the BI. That, that, that's not why we read it. But the, of course, the more we read it, the more we, you know, Frank Epstein really did wear his stethoscope in his belt. <laughs> However, so, so, so I was on attending rounds, and, and the chair would, would, would um, you know, visit attending rounds. And so Frank Epstein came with us as we were dealing with one of our uh, renal patients, who was an apologist. And he so carefully listened to the presentation as we're huddling around all 10 or 12 of us. And, and um, there, there, there were major kind of clinical uh, forks here. And he finally kind of very thoughtfully kind of rocking a little bit, he says, well, I think we've really managed to rule out all the significant pathology that we would need to, 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 to uh, um, initiate treatment now. And if we hang some lactated ringers, maybe it was, 
uh, and give it 48 hours. We're going to see whether we're... And everyone kind of... And then he turns to me, the little third-year student with my red name tag. He says, what, what do you think? And uh, I said, um, I think we've ruled out all the major renal pathology <laughs> here. And if we hang some lactated ringer and give it for you, I did that. And he laughed. He puts his arm around me. He accompanies me down the hall. And I say, so what you got to do is listen. You know? But I didn't feel any of the, any of the cranky, angsty anywhere in the BI. So when I say it's counterfactual, I experienced a tender, caring environment. Uh, the interns I saw were fantastic. And I did not see the kind of pathology that's in the book. And so I learned, you, you taught me um, a lesson, not about the, the, the heinous experience of internship, but about the fact that there are multiple contradictory truths. That's it. And, and I think that's the lesson of the life, that there are multiple contradictory truths. I, too, Steve, uh, find law number four the most important one in the house of God. But I use it when some of my colleagues are feeling sorry for themselves. And talking about their suffering, I say, no, no, no. <laughs> Law number four, the patient is the one with the disease. <laughs> do, you, do, you see? do you see? So, so you know, back then I was not a literary scholar. This was before I got any training in. in so I read the book, and I didn't, I didn't know the ins and outs of what's the difference between black comedy and savagery, and is this irony or is this satire? But I knew that it was explaining a universe, a parallel universe, a universe that you couldn't ever say was true. And so what it means, and I look into the eyes of the creator, it, this is not Sam Shem himself. As, as you, this is not Sam Shem himself. There is no Sam Shem. This is someone named Steve Bergman. This is not Sam Shem himself, but the Sam Shem, the narrator of this work, had a particular truth within his particular lived experience, or his or her particular lived experience. And that's what we read. That's what we read. What I can't wait to hear is from the, uh, the young man at the, at the end of the aisle here, who's a current um, uh, student or intern student. Yeah. So, so we're going to hear from the current uh, uh, experiences of this, how true this might be. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, may I ask one first question? How many years were you banned from the Beth Israel Hospital? <laughs> no, this was for Dr. Uh, for Shem. When's the last time they let you back into the BI? Uh, I think it was about 20 years after the book uh, was published, <laughs> and I was honored. Uh, it was under new management. <laughs> <laughs> and I carefully, there was an absolute packed hall like this, and I carefully looked around, and then I said, this just goes to show, live long enough, the people who hate you either die or retire. <laughs> Okay. Shall I? Please. Uh, well, that's a good question, uh, Rita. I just want to give sincere, sincere thanks to uh, Bob Grossman, Steve Abramson, the wonderful David Oshinsky, who's a great humanist, and to uh, Art, Rita. Um, uh, five years ago, I got a call saying, out of the blue, saying, how'd you like to be a uh, professor of medicine at NYU Med? And I said, what? <laughs> I was just happily writing at that time. I hadn't been in a hospital for a long time. And I said, what do you want me to do? And Steve, who called me, said, uh, we want you to teach. And I said, what do you want me to teach? And I said, well, we want you to teach the house of God <laughs> and do a seminar for medical students. Now, you know, Harvard hated me for the house of God, et cetera. And to have this invitation 
um, was remarkable for me. Um, and it changed my life in a way that I will say. Let me just split this brief introduction to, uh, to two things. Then, the, the title of this is Healing Then and Now. So I'm going to talk about then and I'm going to talk about now briefly, and then we can get into it all. Uh, the House of God started as a catharsis. Uh, I had a feeling uh, that I get sometimes a, hey, wait a second moment. Uh, this is so bad, somebody's got to write it, and I guess that's me. And that's what gets me going in a spirit of resistance. Um, I never wanted to write a novel. I had written plays and short stories and poems. I never wanted to write a novel, but I was looking for a play agent, and I was just starting my psychiatric training. And somebody gave me the name of a play agent. So I wrote in and I said, wrote her and I said, uh, I'm looking for a play agent. And then down at the bottom, I said, P.S. I've got something of a manuscript, uh, beginning of a manuscript about a, a novel, a medical novel. And uh, she wrote back and said, I don't do plays. Send me what you have. So I sent her this horrible, stained, single space, marked up thing. I didn't really think anything of it. I forgot all about it. Two weeks later, I'm standing in the middle of McLean Hospital at the secretary's bank and the phone rings and she says, oh, it's for you, an uh, 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 agent that you said you, you uh, sent something to. I'd even forgotten her name. And this was the first feedback for, of this, what would become the reason we're here today. And she said, you know, um, uh, I don't know if you're uh, a mad, more, mad man or a genius, but I really like what you sent me. And I actually had the sense to say, well, I can't help you there, but you should know I'm speaking to you from within a large, within a large mental institution at this time. <laughs> and that was the start. Um, it started in craziness, and some still think it's kind of crazy. But in, in a partial answer to your, to your question, I'm, at, uh, for some reason, as an editor told me on The House of God, I'm best if I write one step off real quote, maybe satire. I think it's truth. I think it's truth. I think it's heightened truth, which, because as Tolstoy said, it communicates our fe the feeling of the writer to the feeling of the reader. It's as simple as that. And um, it was all about uh, how you make a response to an unjust system. Um, and the question, of course, I mean, we cared about our patients. That was the problem. We were idealistic people who cared, and we weren't allowed to do our job in that system. In, in preparation, I, I look back on an early, you know, like one of the first manuscripts I wrote for the House of God, and, it, and I found this. It was a, pro, a preface. I'd even forgotten I'd written a preface. And it's, it, this is it. This is, this is where that guy was 45 years ago, 1975. Preface, as you read this, you may think it extreme, sick, and unbalanced doctor's imagination run amok. No, virtually all of this is true. Looking back, having gone through it, and now having written it down, part of me is sad, part of me is laughing, and part of me is appalled. In retrospect, it seems so cynically bizarre, yet over and over again, my senses are assaulted with the knowledge that this is what happened during my internship year at one of the most prestigious teaching hospitals called the House of God in the world. So the sad part about the book it is, is that virtually all of it is true. Why write it? Because it hasn't been written, and because now it seems important to do so. Perhaps now out of the house, yet living with the title physicians, it's important for me to put it down, to straighten it out. Perhaps because looking back, at the brutalization and impoverishment of feeling, something might be seen that up until now has been obscure. Why did it happen? I don't know. I do know that there was little choice in the matter of it happening. Little choice if those involved were to survive. Reading it now, it seems sad, strange, funny, and sadistic. Part of me doesn't like it, but more of me wants it told. Mm. The particular hospital and the real persons have been disguised as best I could disguise them. It is dedicated to the hardcore of the house staff of the house, which my guy's sitting here. We'll hear from them later. That's, that blew me away. It blew me away. I, no memory. And, uh, you know, you can see a young man. I was, I was 30. We were all 30. 
We were 27. Most of the guys were 27. I was 30. We were kids. And we were very idealistic because we came through the 60s. We never hesitated to bring attention to injustice. We thought that if we got together, we could change it. And in the book, the problem that happens is we get isolated from each other, from, the, from our true perception of the hospital, and also from people outside. And so everything goes wrong. Um, let, me, let, me, let me switch to now. And um, this was the incredible thing that NYU did for me. I was, as I said, I was out of medicine for many years, really. Uh, I got this call. I, of course, said yes. I mostly, for better or worse, say yes to things. Uh, I don't run on fear. I run on guilt. <laughs> Um, and um, what happened was I came in touch, I got in touch with medicine now. And it's remarkable, incredible. I loved NYU medicine. I really did. I felt that the guys, the three guys at the top of NYU were bringing a message of uh, kindness and consideration for the patient. You could feel it all up and down. The, uh, the hierarchy of, the, even the guy, I spent a night overnight in Bellevue, uh, emerged, the guy emptying the trash at 3 a.m. was not surly, he wasn't resenting his job. So I'm saying, why is it so good? Why, how did it get this way? The three guys at the top at that time were Bob Press, who's there, Steve Abramson, and Bob Grossman, three refugees from the house of God. <laughs> they weren't gonna, abuse people the way they had been abused. I really believe that. So um, I started to teach this seminar of House of God, which I'd never done before, taught it. And it just was remarkable for me to look at it. And, and the, the thing that was very reassuring to me, uh, it was a six session in the Humanities Series seminar, and 90 minutes straight, no break, each session for weeks in a row. And I said to the kids, <laughs> You know, no phones, no computers. And I didn't know what would happen. They sit, we just go through the book. They sit there riveted. A couple of people who were in it, in, who you'll hear from later. Uh, you can hear a pin drop the whole way for a whole other system now of medicine. But the feelings are true. So that was uh, a great reward. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing when I wrote The House of God. I just kind of jumped in there. I knew it was unjust. Uh, one of the things that has happened is because I got a chance to see what medicine is now, we are celebrating today not just The House of God, but the nine month away publication of the sequel to The House of God, which is set in modern times, called Man's Fourth Best Hospital. It'll be out next October. Um, and I, you know, if I hadn't gone to NYU, there would have been no sequel, none. Um, I want, I'll read just one, uh, one page of this, of the, of the new book, to show you where we are now. Um, as the narrator, you know, Roy, Roy in the House of God, the first line is, uh, they're in France, uh, except for her sunglasses, Barry is naked, you may remember. The first line of this book, they're in Costa Rica looking back, and it's, except for her eyes, Barry is fully clothed. <laughs> and it's 40 years, you know. Um, but the narrator says, on looking back to describe why he wrote this book, this new book, Man's Fourth, is uh, it was a crucial time when med med medicine could go one of two ways, either toward more humane medicine or toward money, and screens, meaning the EMR. Money and screens, he says. And then he says, which is money and money. And that's a central, that's the central theme in the book, is how we doctors, patients, and hospitals are coping with this uh, horrific uh, thing that we've come upon. And this is, this is just an example of, uh, of, uh, of how, how things have changed in a, in, a, in a visit to the doctor. 
Your visit to your doctor has become satire. You walk in, luckily if, lucky if you get eye contact, and sit across the desk. Your doctor is trapped, but hunched behind a computer screen, back or shoulder to you. The doc asks a question, you answer, the keyboard goes click, click, de click, faster and faster. On and on it goes and you find yourself in the patient's dilemma. Do I keep talking or wait for a break in the action? Usually the next question. Is he or she still listening or not? The new definition of a good doctor, one who can contort his or her body to touch, tap, touch type while still making eye contact. As you keep waiting, two questions may enter your mind. What is she or he doing? What you don't know is that your doctor is sitting there in front of that screen seething because he's forced to sit in front of a screen seething instead of what he wants to do, talk and listen and be your doctor. He spends 60% of every workday, at least six hours, in front of that screen. This is the doctor's dilemma. You might think, or the second question, why is he or she doing this? You might think she's doing it because it will be better for your health care. It may not, well not be. It may even be worse. Worse for your care, and for sure, worse for your, the care of your doctor. It's only better, better for the money, the healthcare industry. This machine, you see, was not primarily designed for care, but for billing, to make as much money as possible. We doctors are caught in this mess. We're not only treating the patient, we're treating the screen. And it's not that your doctor wants to turn his or her back on you. It's the healthcare industry that has turned its back on both you and your doctor. So that's what we're facing today. Now, that's the now. Okay. Thank you. Um, may I take the first question, then we'll open it up. And I think in getting to know Shem over the past several years, the message of the house of God and of all of our relations is one of connection. I think that's one of the most important points you make. Uh, now the computer is a disconnect, perhaps. But I'm wondering on the panelists, if you think today versus one's memory of 40 years ago, uh, is it harder to make connections? It was obviously hard then. How do you compare these two eras? Uh, say doctors to doctors, for example. Rita, do you want to comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one reason the computer seems so much the enemy is because it's a piece of furniture and you have to move toward it. Um, it is the case that one can alter one's routine in an office. One need not type and talk at the same time. Um, I'm always very impressed with how obedient we physicians have become. Um, and I wonder how come more of us don't simply use the time in the way we think is most fruitful which may be to not type and to not write and to put your hands in your lap and to say to the patient, tell me what you're going through. Um, and then you're going to have to write it down somehow and you're going to have to click some boxes for sure and you're going to have to do the e-scripts and the e-referrals. But what I mourn is that we don't seem to have more agency um, than, than we are currently uh, uh, demonstrating. And, and, I mean, what would happen if all the members of a, of a multi-group, uh, multi-specialty practice said, well, we're going to take 30 minutes a patient instead of the 12 you want to give us and kind of go from there. So my question is one of activism. You said we all grew up in the 60s. We sure did. And we knew that we could stop a war. Remember? We stopped a war. And so we get, we get into, into professional life, but we're still activists. We know how to stop wars. So why is this so hard for, for physicians to band together and say, this is bad for patients. You don't do anything meaningful in 12 minutes or 11 minutes or 10 minutes. My job is not to increase the revenue of the corporation of which my hospital uh, belongs. Um, so we're going to do the ethical thing. Why doesn't that happen? Okay, can we uh, let's open to the audience questions for any of the panelists? Shall we? Let's 
So, so Steve, let's let me just ask you, Steve or Shem. You've seen interns. You worked with interns and residents. Now you were an intern resident. What's forget the computer and that? What's the difference about relationships between house officers, perhaps? Or did you able to see anything then and now? <clears throat> yeah. What, what, what's the uh, what's about relationships between house officers now? Um, well, it's it's kind of ironic because one of the difficult things that we went through, we were talking about it last night, the guys, uh, was how we were always so tired, how we were exhausted. We were really exhausted. And uh, yet we, we, we had great relationships. We, we really did, uh, strong ones. They're here today. It's interesting thinking about it, that people, that, that the house staffs now uh, have a lot more time off. They're not as exhausted when they're here. That's not, that's been taken pretty much out of the equation. And yet, from a lot of talking to a lot of interns and residents, uh, many hospitals for me, um, relationships inside the hospital are not nearly as tight. The, the, well, as, as Janet Surrey, my, my wife and wonderful co-author on many things, developed the relational uh, theory of psychology that the measure of a person's psychological health is the quality of their connections, mm -hmm. not just the self. Mm -hmm. And the quality of connections among house staff now um, is not that good. One, one thing is that the, I don't think, I don't think the quality is very good, partly because what happens is they do rounds with computers, they run to their screens, to type up what they've done. They're in parallel, th think of it. They're, they're on parallel screens often doing rounds, at least at MGH I noticed that. And then they go to their cubicles. They have things between them in the places that they type up things. So they're not talking with each other. There isn't all that stuff. And in the house of God, what did we do? We talked. Mm -hmm. We talked like crazy. The fat man never stopped talking, you know. And, and we joked. Um, we, we did everything that one would do in, a, in the trenches. Yeah. Um, and, and here it's kind of not trenches anymore. Where's the, where's the thing that's the problem here? It's very, you know, it's a little vague. And so I think the relationships, and also because of the shift work, the main relationships outside get a chance to be really, really important. We didn't have great uh, relationships outside. outside. Right. As I said, we got isolated from inside. the people outside our hospital. And here you'd think that there'd be more time to you know, have good relationships in that outside, and maybe that's true, but within, I think, I think it's, it's more, more solitude. Hmm. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Maybe I, somebody wants to talk about that in the audience who's in it. Right. Let Art make a comment, then we'll get other comments from the audience about it. So just a couple of comments. Um, I do remember uh, in the old days of conversation, uh, sometimes people would say, can you bring me the patient's chart? And maybe three days later, they would. <laughs> it was a very different information system. I wouldn't call it wondrous. I used to wonder how many people were going to die because of penmanship errors, but um, it took a long time. And often the charts couldn't be found at all, as a matter of fact. People just couldn't find them. I remember that happening not infrequently. So that's one version of IT that from a different time. Here's another from a 1970s perspective. Uh, are we going to tell the patient the diagnosis? Well, why would we? They don't need to know. When I came into this, it was a very paternalistic world between doctor and patient. And by the time, uh, well, maybe 10, 15 years later, the pendulum may have swung too far the other way, but we heard a lot about patient autonomy. And that was a legacy of your 60s activism, as a matter of fact. It was the notion that we're not gonna just have professionals drive decision-making for individuals with different backgrounds, different cultural views, and kind of respect for their particular personal values. So I have seen shifts. I don't think they're all bad. But I wonder when we, I, I know the phenomenon of 
addressing the computer. I live through it. Some of my faculty in the division will say they live through it because I sometimes do it myself. I'm watching my email and talking to them. So I know what that's like. I occasionally tell myself not to do it, uh, but it's only occasionally. And um, I do think that in part, the IT world is everywhere. It isn't just that your doctor is looking at the thing. My uh, students are outside the office, online. I can talk to anybody I want at any hour, trust me, by emailing them or texting them or sending them some electronic communication. I may not, quote, talk to them, but I can uh, communicate. I'm laughing. I think I've emailed Eli down there at 4 in the morning about something. So uh, it's a different world. That's my point. I, I, I understand that we want that personal touch as a patient when we're sick, you want the attention, but there's a lot of ways in which that's evaporating out of the culture generally. It isn't just happening at the doctor's office. Hell, it, you know, last time I went to Jiffy Lube, the guy didn't talk to me. <laughs> okay, Co questions, comments? Yes, please. Yes, I'm sorry. Hi. You can use the microphone. I was in the tunnels uh, in an office on Saturday nights thinking I was experiencing the highest concentration of psychosis at any given spot in the world at that moment with my legs on the desk because rats were scurrying <laughs> around the tunnels. I remember those days, and yet I remember them follow up very fondly in certain ways. Dr. Sharon, I was really impressed by the response, or perhaps the lack of, to your comment. Where's the activism? Why aren't physicians standing up for what they know to be the right thing? I went to a presentation at the 92nd Street Y a couple of weeks ago, and it was Siddhartha Mukherjee uh, debating with Elizabeth Colbert, he talking about life, eternal life, and she talking about the end of the world as we know it because of global warming. And I think about doing the right thing. And perhaps Dr. Kaplan, Shem, you also can respond to this. There are so many right things that need to be done at this point in time. So the lack of response, I know for me when you asked that question, at first I felt kind of terrible, but I realized some of it was just feeling overwhelmed. Do we pay attention to the end of the globe? Do we pay attention to the fracturing and the destruction of children and families who are being torn, about, torn apart by current immigration policies? Uh, where do we start? So there's not a whole lot I can do about global warming, myself. But there's a whole lot I can do about the routines in the particular clinic, in the particular hospital, that I happen to be, uh, you know, a, 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 a chair in the medical school of. So, so we need to put our hands on whatever levers are within our reach and pull the damn things as hard as we can. You so, know I am with you, but I remember in the old days when there was talk about activism and, um, and protest, we would get threatened yeah. with uh, the, the likelihood of lawsuits because yeah. we were involved in price fixing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so, could I, could so I these just, are big <laughs> fights. Yeah. We should, um, we're running a little bit out of time. Oh. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Yes, right there. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Lisa Baker. I'm a family practitioner on Long Island and connected with NYU. And um, not from when you went to school, but only took typing in ninth grade. So suddenly three years, after 27 years of practicing medicine, three years ago, the computer came in. And what I do is I use the computer with the patient. 
I sit, I look at them. Physicals are half hour, follow-ups are 15, give or take. Sometimes you're over, sometimes you're under. And then after I do my history and I examine them, I wheel the computer around and we look at it together. Yes. They tell me what I'm not in the box. Right. They tell me if I spelled something wrong. Right. They see what's there. Right. And I think they learn from it too. Yes. They correct stuff because it's like a rumor. Someone types something in there and they're like, no, I never had my appendix out. Meanwhile, follows them everywhere they go. So I think that we're resourceful, we're Good. creative, we care about our patients, and if they know that, we can take the new with the old and not throw either out. If I have to send some to the ER, I love that I can print up the note. And when they go to the ER, not only does it say what I want them to do, they can read all their past history. If I send them to a specialist, same thing. I can send the note right over. I give the patient copies of the notes because I say the ER admitting nurse may keep these. You whip them out when the doctor comes. So I think you can embrace still caring with the new technology. Yep. And every two months, there's another box I have to check. So we try to figure it away. And most of my notes, I finish a little bit later, you know, unless they're going somewhere and I have to finish it. And I have templates. And I'm just going to get better at it. And yep. I'm just going to work it into the way I practice. Mm -hmm. OK, other so. questions? Thank you. Yes, in the back. I want to address this more to Dr. Sharon's comments about why. Um, first, I should start off by saying I went to medical school a little bit earlier than Dr. Shem, also in Boston, at another medical school. And uh, I spent a lot of my time at Boston City Hospital as a medical student, and then came to Bellevue, where I did my residency. And then went into private practice, where I was a solo practitioner. Mm. I think the big difference today is the fact that almost all physicians are employed. And they have competing forces going to them. On the one hand, they, have to, they feel like they want to be advocate for the patient, but they feel the pressure of working in a corporate environment where they're feared, they're afraid of losing their job and their right. position. Right. And I don't know how to resolve that. In terms of the changes that occurred from the time that I went into practice, which was at the time that you were an intern in 73, it was very different. And then as the corporate world in, 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 invaded us with managed care and so on, the way I perceived my role was to act as the advocate for the patient mm -hmm. in adversity to the system. Yeah. And I think, with all due respect, young physicians today are so pressured by being part of the system, they're afraid to act as advocates solely. I didn't have to worry. I was a solo practitioner. Nobody was going to fire me. Okay. Nobody was going to tell me I wasn't seeing enough patients, okay? If I did right by the patients, they would come back and they would refer their friends and colleagues to me. So the only thing I had to worry about was taking care of patients, mm -hmm. not dealing with the system. Now we're in this big complex, and I don't know how to resolve okay. it, but I think that's a big difference. Yeah. Good, good point, thank you very much. We're running towards the end. I want to put a question to the panel, particularly to um, the physicians. Um, so it's. 40 years later, would you rather be an intern today or in 1975? Me? You first, Rita. Uh, I would hate to be an intern today. Absolutely hate it. Um, it turns out, you know, there's a lot of talk about burnout now and house staff as well as doctors. A uh, huge thing. And they have, there's a sort of McCulloch burnout scale or something. I can't remember Matlock. the name. Matlock. Matlock, yeah. And it has four different things I can't remember, you know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> A paper came out recently that uh, the only explanation for why these four symptoms in doctors, which are serious, like a friend of mine went psychotic over Epic, actually, recently. Psychotic, McLean Hospital for three weeks. Psychotic. Um, but the, uh, the only correlation to when these uh, things got worse in the last, what, eight years, seven years, is guess what? The introduction of the electronic medical record. You don't understand. In the house of God, we had none of this. Um, even like eight years ago, six years ago, we had none of this 
electronic medical record. And now it has taken over. I, couldn't, I personally could not survive in this system uh, as, as an intern. Uh, I, I, I couldn't. And I have, you know, uh, anyway, enough said. I, I think what we had then had a sense of being able to get to the humanity. We were very human every single day on rounds. We went into every room, we talked, we then we had in-person you know, conferences all the time. People don't, if you're spending 80% of your time in front of your screen in a hospital as an intern, which is, is true, if you figure maybe 5% for bathroom and eating, how much face time do you have? You have about two, 5%, 6% of face time. That is a horrible barrier to humanity, I think the only solution to cut to the chase is to squeeze the money out of the machines. When I asked, when I talked to some uh, Boston University med students, um, they, re they said, oh, there was only one good computer system that we use, the VA. Why the VA? Because it's not for profit. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, or. So I'll take a different angle. Would I rather be a patient in 1973 or today? I'd much rather be a patient today, no doubt about it. I don't care if my doctor is contorted. They have many more tools to bring to bear on my disease than they did 40 years ago. So uh, as someone who just underwent a hip, uh, excuse me, a knee replacement that took 45 minutes to do the operation, would have been either non-existent or seven years in 1973. I think those are the first artificial uh, limbs coming out. But I'll say two other things, just to end on a slightly upbeat note. <clears throat> I can't speak for other places, but my NYU students are plenty idealistic. We may ruin them in the process of <laughs> what happens to them here, but they're very idealistic. They're not lacking in activism. They care. They came to medicine as a calling still, not so much as a, to make money or so on. More of them are interested, I would concede, sometimes in becoming managers or having a, a company spin out. But I think partly that's good because there's more opportunity for that to work. So OK, I can live with that. But I see uh, what people are saying about the system uh, being a system that uh, has its own momentum, a game, I think, of medical education. And we try to do this, I think, at least with our undergrads and to the extent we can, even into residency, is to make sure that medical ethics doesn't yield to business ethics. Right. It's, it's still there. It's not that people don't want to be advocates for their patients or don't want to uh, take on uh, tough value questions. And in some ways, they do better than they did 40 years ago. But there is something else to battle, engage, work with, work around. Not all of it is bad. Some of it exacts a toll. But I think the question is, can we preserve what professional and medical ethics is all about within the system? I'm somewhat optimistic that we can, but it's a battle. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Rita, one last question. Yeah, the only comment. thing to add to that is, uh, I don't see much value in nostalgia. I don't think it's a particularly useful thing to look back and say, was not it swell? Um, uh, there are many, many more things besides the electronic medical record that have changed. And that's one among like really um, 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 powerful forces that are making the lives of interns and future physicians completely different from ours. The whole, the whole landscape of medicine is changing. I mean, it's, it's AI and VR and, and telemedicine and remote and instantaneous and robotics and the precision medicine to actually, we, we're not there yet, but soon to be able to know what's the exact mutation that's causing this particular uh, 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 glomerular nephritis and what's the exact treatment that will help this individual patient. So it's a whole very different genre of personalized medicine, um, which is not an enemy. 
and which we can look forward to. The reason to want to be an intern now instead of an intern 40 years ago is you want to be around when the great big changes are happening. And that's now. Okay, thank you. And thank each of you for a really terrific discussion. Thank, thank you. you.